This talk is on abdominal radiology AXR 101. My name is Wei Ming, a senior resident in radiology. At the end of this session, you will be able to develop a basic approach to interpreting abdominal radiographs, identify relevant anatomy on abdominal radiographs, as well as recognize common and important findings on abdominal radiographs. Here are the key points that I'll be going through. I'll be talking about X-ray densities, the normal bowel gas pattern, discussing the different types of extra luminal air, before going on to the soft tissue organs within the abdomen. And of course, there are different types of calcifications that can be seen, so we'll be talking about them. And lastly, touching briefly on the review areas. There are five different types of radiographic densities. We have gas, which is the lightest and appears as black. And then we have metal on the other end, which is the densest and appears as white. In general, we describe things on radiograph as radiolucent when they are darker relative to soft tissue or radio opaque when they are brighter to soft tissue. So as an example, if you look at the lungs, it's radiolucent to the liver and the metal or bones will be radio opaque to say the muscles. One thing to take note is that fluid will appear similar in color to soft tissue because they are of same or similar density on radiographs. For bowel gas pattern, I will not go through too much because I think we are all very familiar with them. But basically, small bowel will be in the central abdomen. They have these thin mucosal folds called bowel conniventis, and they are quite tightly spaced together, and they will span across the entire width of the bowel. In the periphery, we will have the large bowel, and they have these circulations, which are called horstrations, and these do not span across the entire width of the bowel and so can help you distinguish between large and small bowel. I'm sure all of us know about the 3, 6, 9 rule. So the diameter for small bowel will be 3 cm, large bowel 6 cm, with the exception of cecum that can go all the way up to 9 cm. One important principle that I want to bring your attention to is that gas is your friend. Uh, you should make full use of them, take advantage of them because they can tell you a lot of information. Firstly, they can tell you where the normal gas-containing organ is, so for example, the bowel or the lungs. Secondly, they can identify where pathology is. So if they are within organs that do not normally contain gas, that may be where the abnormality is. And third, if there is a perforated viscous with extra luminal air, you may want to try to identify whether it's intraperitoneal or retroperitoneal. Remember that air is very light, so it will always rise. So depending on how the x-ray is taken, whether it's supine or erect position, air can appear very differently. So we will move on to the types of extra luminal air. The first one we have here is gas in the bowel wall, intramural gas. So if you see here, these are mortal gas lucencies within the bowel wall. They are a sign of bowel ischemia. And of course, if we do find them and we are suspecting bowel ischemia, we look at the liver. Why? Because we want to look for autovenous gas, which is another sign of our ischemia. Of course, if the patient is very well, asymptomatic walking around, then you need to know that there are many other causes of intramural gas as stated over here. Next, we have intraperitoneal gas, so gas within the peritoneal cavity. It is an indicator of perforated hollow viscous, so it's a surgical emergency. The most common sign that we all know of is air under the diaphragm. But please take note that this is only usually seen when the x-ray is taken in an erect position because the air rises. If it's taken in a supine position, you may or may not see it. And that's when you look for other signs. So we have a regular sign over here, which is then you have air on either side of the bowel wall, accentuating the bowel outline. So usually, if you just have normal bowel gas, for example, this loop of bowel, you can't really see the wall that well. But once you have extra luminal gas outlining the bowel wall, you suddenly can see the bowel wall very clearly, and this is not normal. Of course, there are many, many, many signs of pneumoperitoneum, at least 10 of them. I do not have time to go through all of them. 
retroperitoneal gas. So basically, it's gas in the retroperitoneal space. So you want to look for gas around retroperitoneal organs and what are they? So the ascending and descending colons are two of them. You also want to look at the psoas muscles and around the kidneys. Once you identify them, you can say that there's retroperitoneal gas and usually it's due to perforated retroperitoneal hollow organ or discus. So this will be the ascending, descending colon, the second to fourth part of the duodenum, as well as the proximal rectum. But one thing to take note is it doesn't always mean perforation because any pathology in the retroperitoneum with, uh, that can produce gas, for example, infection, can also result in retroperitoneal gas. Next, we have portal venous gas. So these tubular gas-like lucencies with branching pattern, extending all the way out to the periphery within the liver, are the portal venous gas, and it's a sign of bowel ischemia, as I mentioned earlier. Of course, it can be mistaken for pneumobilia, which is gas within the biliary tree, because this can also appear as tubular and branching gas lucencies. However, they are usually central in location as opposed to portal venous gas that extend out to the periphery. After that, you want to look at a soft tissue. So what soft tissue do we have? In the right upper quadrant, we have the liver. Left upper quadrant, the spleen. We don't want to forget the kidneys. And of course, the pelvis will always have the bladder. And then the psoas muscles over here beside the vertebral bodies. One useful tip to identify the kidney shadows is to look for the psoas shadow. And then you just look laterally, you'll find the kidney shadow. So calcifications, here are some of the common calcifications that we can identify. Renal calculus, gallstones, appendicolis sometimes, parenchymal calcifications, masses or tumors, and then vascular calcifications. So for renal calculus, it's important to note that they can occur anywhere along the urinary tract. So you must make sure you inspect the kidneys, the ure ureters, which were caused along the lateral margins of the transverse process, and then all the way down to the bladder. There are three anatomical narrowings of the urinary tract system that may cause the calculus to be stuck. So these are the pyloureteric junction, the pelvic brim where the ureters crosses over the bifurcation of common iliac vessels and the vesicle ureteric junction. Next, we have gallstones, which are in the right upper quadrant. They tend to be multiple, laminated and faceted in appearance. Sometimes, but not often, we can identify appendicolis, especially in the correct clinical tissue. Is usually in the right lower quadrant where the appendix is. And then we can have parenchymal calcification. So one example of this is chronic pancreatitis resulting in multiple punctate uh, calcifications in the upper abdomen. Of course, tumor can also have calcification. One classic example would be dermoexis. So they can have all these tooth-like calcifications with fat lucencies. And you might want to look in the pelvis because they tend to arise in ovaries. Next, we have vascular calcifications. So first, we have flebolis. There are calcifications within the venous system and commonly appear in the pelvis. They tend to have this kind of rounded shape with central lucency. And if they are very close to the urinary bladder, you might mistake them for urinary calculus. However, Urinary calculus is usually more ovoid or linear in shape and don't really have the lucent center. The other way you can tell is by location. So you can draw a line, if you see here, along the ischial spine, which is this bony prominence. If you draw a line across, anything below is unlikely to be the urinary calculus because the vesical ureteric junction ends above the level of the ischial spines. And lastly, we do not want to miss any rhythm, right? So always look to the left of the vertebral body for curvy linear calcifications as in here. So moving on to review areas, always look at the lung bases for consolidation and masses. Look at the other soft tissue outside of the abdomen. Those pathologies can also hide there, like herniated bowel in the groin. 
and do not forget the bones. You should always look at the bones for pathologies like fractures or destruction and so on. This is an example of a checklist you may want to use. The A, B, C, S, R checklist. A stands for air, including extraluminal air. B for bowel gas pattern and bones. C for calcifications. S for soft tissue shadows. And lastly, R for review areas. With this, you should be able to approach any abdominal radiograph you encounter. Please watch the next module for a more in-depth review of abdominal radiology.